In our 21st century urbanized world, buildings of enormous height and size are all around us and are so familiar a sight that we rarely pay them much attention. We are accustomed to living, working, and shopping in them. When a new one is built, we see huge cranes and other heavy machinery employed, with elevators and lifts taking contractors up to where they need to be. Anybody time traveling from the medieval world to now would be understandably astonished by what we can achieve. Yet the reverse is also true. We cannot of course travel back to medieval times. But we can stand next to a vast cathedral such as Canterbury and wonder how on earth it could be constructed by people who had only the most basic of tools. There has been a cathedral in Canterbury for more than 1,400 years. St. Augustine consecrated the first cathedral there not long after his arrival in the year 597. There is no trace of the original building, as a fire in 1067 destroyed it and it had to be completely rebuilt. Archbishop Lanfranc oversaw much of the construction, but it was his successor, Archbishop, and later Saint, Anselm, who built the glorious choir, off which more later, and the enormous crypt. The credit might be Anselm's but his hands were not the ones that wielded axes, hammers and chisels, and mixed mortar that is still holding up the walls after almost a thousand years. Those people, with their remarkable skill and ingenuity, were the medieval stonemasons. The Stonemasons Guild, the worshipful company of masons, is one of the ancient livery companies of the City of London. It was formed for the purpose of regulating the craft of stonemasonry and ensuring that standards could be properly maintained and rewarded. The earliest available records of regulation from the Court of Aldermen are from 1356. The preceding two centuries had already seen massive growth in stone construction, royal, ecclesiastical, and municipal, and alongside that came major developments in the skill of stone masonry. Stonemasons were by no means a homogeneous group. Their skills ranged from the most basic to outstanding artistry, though the categories of workers were fluid. Rates of pay varied from job to job too. Before stone could be used as a building material, it first had to be dug from the earth and that was the task of the quarrymen. The records use the term quarrymen to refer to those who owned the quarries as well as those who worked in them. While the quarry owners were frequently men of means and high social standing, those who worked within the quarries were not. The work was backbreaking, digging, and breaking stones in poor conditions that led to health problems like silicosis, a lung disease induced by inhaling flinty or silicious particles. The quarriers also partially or completely worked the stone before it was transported to its destination, as they saved on cost. In addition to supplying stone, the quarries often served as schools where stoneworkers could learn the basics of the craft, before moving on to more skilled employment and better rates of pay. Rough masons and layers prepared wall stone with scapling hammers and might also hew stone with an axe into the approximate shape required. The fine carving was done with a mallet and chisel and this was the work of the freestone mason. The freestone mason did not simply step in and apply the last artistic flourishes. He would also have had to be an expert stone hewer and layer to ensure that intricate work fitted perfectly and robustly together. Building work was not solely the preserve of men either. The records show women working as mason servants and plasterers. Overseeing any project was the master mason, frequently assisted by an undayar master or a second master mason. Master masons were not just the most skilled stone workers, they were architects, designers, and visionaries as well as capable administrators. They had shared responsibility with the abbey or nobleman who had embarked on the construction project for the financial accounts. These covered every aspect of expenditure, wages, materials, and transport. The master masons were involved in the hiring and dismissal of their workers. In general, masons were a highly mobile group. They traveled to where the biggest and best paying jobs were, including from country to country. Quarrymen tended to live locally to their work. For the best work to be produced, the most suitable materials had to be sourced. Huge quantities of wood went into building a structure like Canterbury Cathedral. But wood is much easier to source and transport than stone. And it could not be just any stone, it had to be soft and easy to carve. Canterbury's cream limestone came from Cannes in Normandy as it could be delivered by ship, rather than trying to move the stone along medieval roads. Such transport was not without risk. 
An account exists from the days of William I of a flotilla of 15 ships that were sailing from Can with cargoes of stone. 14 carried stone for the king's new palace at Westminster and one was full of stone for St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury. The ships foundered in a terrible storm and 14 were lost. The one with the Canterbury stone was about to suffer the same fate. The master and crew prayed to St. Augustine himself, bailed furiously, and made it as far as the Sussex port of Bramber, where the ship split open and all the stone ended up on the sands. The master got hold of another ship, reloaded his cargo, and delivered the stone to the abbey. A delighted abbot paid the master a bonus of some shillings. A relieved master offered half the money to God and St. Augustine in thanks for his miraculous escape. Speaking of saints and miracles, Canterbury Cathedral's most famous archbishop is another saint, Thomas Becket, who was murdered there on December 29, 1170. He was slain by four knights acting on one of King Henry II's legendary outbursts of temper. The knight's original intention may have been to arrest Becket, who had been engaged in a monumental power struggle with the king for several years. But the situation quickly deteriorated, and Becket was hacked to death on one of the altars. The martyrdom is still maintained in the cathedral and one can stand at that very spot. The miracles quickly began. Word quickly spread and the devotion to Becket the martyr began, with his tomb becoming a major site for pilgrimage. It was a huge stroke of good fortune that the monks had chosen to place Becket's body in a stone tomb in the crypt while they set about constructing a shrine. For on September 5, 1174, a fire broke out in three cottages near the cathedral. Unknown to everybody before it was too late, the blaze spread to the roof of the cathedral. A monk, Gervis of Canterbury, wrote a vivid account of the fire, with its black smoke and scorching flames. Consumed by flames, the roof collapsed into the choir and its wooden seats. The flames rose a full fifteen cubits, scorching and burning the walls and causing terrible damage to the stone pillars. Anselm's choir was destroyed. Gervis describes the reaction of those who witnessed it. He talks of people overcome with grief and perplexity, blaspheming at such an event and unable to comprehend that it had happened. A modern reader might dismiss this as an overreaction. But on April 15, 2019, a fire broke out on the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and millions worldwide witnessed a medical cathedral burn in real time. People's reactions on social media and news reports were almost identical to those reported by Gervis eight centuries ago. Back in the 12th century, in Canterbury, the monks were faced with the daunting task of reconstructing their fire-ravaged choir. They commissioned Master Mason William of Sens, known for his brilliance and technical expertise. Unfortunately for him and future generations, William fell from faulty scaffolding in the choir in 1178. He was badly injured and never recovered. He was replaced and the work was finished by another mason, William the Englishman. The stonemasons of Canterbury Cathedral continue their work to this day, with a team of over two dozen. Their job is to conserve and preserve the building. And they work with tools on blocks of stone brought in from a quarry near Cannes just as the masons of a millennium ago did. The stonemasons of Canterbury Cathedral continue their work to this day, with a team of over two dozen. Their job is to conserve and preserve the building. And they work with tools on blocks of stone brought in from a quarry near Cannes just as the masons of a millennium ago did. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more videos.